so just to kind of reiterate, I guess I'll just start out by kind of reiterating what um, I brought up to you over LinkedIn. So basically, uh, I'm in the land side of the business, so different different part of upstream. We buy minerals and royalties in, in the scoop and stack and merge plays of Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, just through various dealings with people, like I said, I'm sure you get this. Sometimes it's like you're talking to someone and they say something because they heard somebody else say it, but they don't really know what it means. Um, and in this case, I've heard, you know, oh, that section's got a fault that runs through it, as if to insinuate that, you know, an operator's not going to drill in that section horizontally because it's got a fault in it. So being that I saw your your videos and your posts, um, kind of took a liking to them right away. Looking forward to the geology vlogs to con uh, continuing and basically just wanted to reach out. I know you have your master's in geology. Uh, so basically just wanted to, uh, bring up this topic to you and from someone who's had professional and, um, uh, formal schooling in geology, uh, you know, what, what's your take on, on faults in a particular section and the obstacles basically that it, um, presents to drilling and recovering hydrocarbons? Well, the section that we are actively drilling in at the rig that I'm on right now uh, is an unconventional reservoir, the Wolf Camp. So faulting in unconventionals when you're drilling through shale uh, essentially makes drilling off in the horizontal uh, a tough deal. Mm -hmm. So when you have, there's a few different types of faults, but uh, the ones that they're running into now are normal faults. Uh, I sent you that, that link about Permian Basin tectonics, um, and what they're running into is what they call basin and range tectonism. So the tectonics that they're coming across are due to what they call extensional tectonics. So this area uh, went under the, the, the Earth's crust is getting slightly thinner, and as it's thinning, um, the Wolf Camp formation is getting stretched. So if you take a rubber band and you stretch it, um, it's kind of what's happening to the Wolf Camp. So as it's happening, uh, it's getting weaker and it's it's kind of falling down. So as it breaks and falls, you know, those are essentially the faults that are created. Um, when they're drilling through that area um, where the, the faulting has occurred, they have to follow along the the wolf camp formation. So if they want to be in the wolf camp A and they come across a fault, you know, one part of it's going to be higher. The next part that they've been drilling through is going to be lower. So the directional drillers, the geo steers um, have to work together with, you know, the drilling crew to make sure that they stay in the formation within the pay zone. And when you come across a fault, the pay zone depth immediately changes. So to stay where you are becomes difficult. You're not necessarily going to always be at the targeted depth. So when you're going to, when you know you're going to be drilling through a highly faulted area, it creates problems for what you expect to be your pay zone where you have the highest, you know, return rate. Um, and, you know, and the, the scoop stack too is a, an unconventional play. Um, Slightly familiar, you know, like the Woodford, right? I think is your a big thing there. Yeah, so it's Woodford mainly hunting Woodford and, and Miss, which obviously these are just, um, I guess you could call them parent zones, and there's, uh, you know, basically child zones in, in, in those formations. For example, in the Miss, there's the Caney and Sycamore. Um, but yeah, uh, the hunting would be the deepest, and then oftentimes, you know, TVDs um, at the Hunting or the Woodford so that uphole there's future pay zones. Uh, and so that was kind of another question I had for you is, so if there's a fault, a severe fault um, in a particular pay zone uphole, uh, could that potentially um, negate that as a, as a future and potential pay zone for the operator? Yeah, definitely. Well, they would drill to it, I would assume, 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you've got an upthrown block of like 5,000 feet, which does occur, um, it uh, a could be gone. You know, it could have been eroded away. But uh, you know, if there's any crazy faulting like that, probably a company wouldn't drill there. I would right. think. Yeah. Um, and faults too, like you know, this is you know all we're talking about right now are unconventionals. You know, drilling through through shale. Um, conventional reservoirs. You know the uh, the North Sea is is controlled by the same regional tectonic action uh, extension, and that created a bunch of normal faults. So you know if your shell oil will the shell and you want to go drill a nice big reservoir um, off in the North Sea, uh, you target faulted zones. You look for where the normal faults happen. And you drill for those faults because the faults act as a as a trap and a seal. So you go look for you know where can I find a large upthrown block, downthrown block, drill on either side, and then you can make a prolific amount of petroleum. And that same effect uh, that can happen anywhere with a fault, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I talked to a guy. Uh, named Jay McGovern out of Corpus Christi, Texas. He uh -huh. drills the, the Frio Sands, um, and he drills, you know, for the faults, for the faulted zones. And, you know, can find a pool of oil that's several hundred thousand barrels, and a small operation can make a whole lot of money um, drilling into, you know, a, a, a normal fault in the middle of, South Texas. Yeah, four hundred thousand AFE making the same amount of oil as a seven million AFE. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, easy money, right? Oh. That's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> it I comes that in, guy. right? Yeah, yeah, he's cool. But uh yeah, um so so essentially a fault depending on and please correct me if I you know, mistake anything, but depending on the severity of the fault can create a number of roadblocks for the driller. Um, so if, if they're drilling into a fault and it drops off, uh, is that something, is that something the, that the operator would know about beforehand that they could potentially be in a situation where they can't through direct, uh, directional drilling technology, they can't, um, make up for the severity of the fault and how it's uh, displacing the rock and, and, and changing their uh, their direction of, of the zone? So uh, 3D seismic, 2D seismic is shot all throughout the country. Um, a good operator will have a great geophysicist and a really good geologist who's going to work together with a petrophysicist, and they're all going to come together and they're going to map everything out before they drill, they're unconventional. Um, the operators are, you know, largely getting away from that uh, because if you have a known targeted zone in an area, uh, you're just going to drill through it, blast shale. But right. if you want to maximize your return, um, you would use seismic data and, uh, you know, borehole geophysics um to map out where you're going to come across large faults so the seismic data uh the resolution you can get today um on shore is good enough great enough that uh you know a fault like we just crossed it was mapped out they knew they were going to come across it um and the geo steers and the directional drillers you know work together um with the drilling crew and, you know, they know that they're not going to immediately stay in, like, the wolf camp day, that, um, you know, they, they might hit a little bit of the bone springs um, or they will be a little higher in the wolf camp A section uh, in the down thrown block if it's more faulted um, before they get back up into, you know, the wolf camp A. Essentially, and they just you know, won't perf there? 
Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, that's they'll plan out their their their, their frack stages based upon uh, well, you know, the mud logging report. Um, you know, if they see a vast majority, if it's like 40% limestone and uh, 60% shale, you know, that's in a uh, a downthrown block where they're hitting, you know, maybe up in some bone springs. Um, you know, they they'll maybe not exactly skip a, a frack stage there, but they won't focus on that as much as, you know, where it's, you've got uh, 150 feet of Wolf Camp Bay above and 150 feet of Wolf Camp Bay below, and you're just going to blow all that out and yeah. suck as much oil out as you can. Right. Gotcha. Makes sense. So the up thrown blocks and down thrown blocks, kind of what I'm talking about is, you know, imagine a V. So, you know, in the middle of that V um, would be, you know, if we're talking about wolf camp, uh, the left side of the V is going to be wolf camp. The right side of the V is going to be wolf camp. And in between is going to be like the boat spring that comes down. So, you know, wolf camp's essentially split in the middle. And where it got weak and split, uh, Bone Spring fell in. That's a great visual. Yeah. Some geologists are probably going to rip me apart and tear me a new <laughs> one because uh, it's not exactly like that, but, you know, it's an intro <laughs> hey, geology course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, that's what's happening. Yeah. So, and... Uh, so you, would, you would essentially, in that case, just like you just said, you, you'd have to in a way, go through the bone spring yeah. uh, to get back into wolf camp. And if you look at, like, geosteering plots, you know, a good geosteer is going to be, it, it's like target shooting with a shotgun. You know, the full choke, you, you're going to have a nice, tight pattern. You know, if you open that choke up, um, it's going to spray out. So, you know, cut the barrel off. You've got a terrible geosteer. Get a 30-inch barrel on your Remington 1100 with a full choke. You're going to have a nice, you know, tight pattern. So a good geo steer will have a nice tight pattern, big long barrel, full choke on, and stay as close as they can to the pay zone. And a shitty geo steer and a terrible directional driller that don't work together are going to be all over the place. So you know the the important part. And that, being, my friends, is how you get a dry hole. <laughs> <laughs> well. You know, that's how you're getting your, uh, all these, you know, big operators are having problems. They're getting 30%, 30% less back than they think. So, you know, you're not getting a dry hole. You're just getting a whole lot less oil and gas back because you're not staying in what you think you're going to be in. You're not going to be in, in the, in the shale play, uh, or shale pay that, that you expect. Right. So there's a bunch of stuff, poor pressure. Um, plotting that people do, they plot out where there's going to be higher pressure within the shale versus lower pressure, and uh, higher pressures within shales usually you get more more gas and oil out of versus low pressure zones, which is all a bunch of modeling stuff that I don't really want to get into. I I want to try to stick to faulting and how faults uh, affect drilling, petroleum production, and everything else in between. Yeah, I think I think it's a really important topic. I don't I don't know if do you feel the same about faults? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Geologists and we get fault happy, and everyone's most not everyone's but everyone's favorite class studying geology is structural. I mean that's like it's the tools. Because I think so. the general consensus of someone that understands faulting to a point but doesn't fully understand it, like I think a, a geologist or a mud logger. Or, you know, whatever does it would would say, well, you know, when you're drilling down, you can only bend the pipe this so much this way or that way. And if you get a fault and it drops off and, you know, you can't really, you know, that's kind of almost the way I think that most people think of faults in terms of uh, with with relation to drilling. But that's kind of why I wanted your your professional um, opinion on it, uh, just to kind of clear the air and um, really, uh, you know, Put put the finger on what it actually is, how it affects drilling, how it affects hydrocarbon hydrocarbon recovery, et cetera. So, but uh, but yeah, you, I mean, you've made some really good points. So, what else would you say about faults 
that people need to know um, when it comes to drilling into them for vertical or horizontal, unconventional? Well, what, what we came across uh, from that video that I had, um, you know, they're uh, the drillers are blaming, you know, the fault for the vast majority of what happened. You know, you drill across the fault, um, getting bigger chunks of rock coming across the shaker table. Um, you know, there, there's probably some washout that's occurring due to the, the rock that's fractured from all the faulting that's occurred. And uh, they think that the mud issues stem from, you know, influx of either what I am calling uh, clay mineralogy and different, you know, clays, swelling clays that could exist. Uh, shout out to my buddy Casey Mitchell rolling out uh, swelling clays within the wolf camp, illite and smectite um, could have turned, you know, drilling mud into a slurry, which then effectively stopped drilling on this well for three days. So we could have drilled into... Um, you know, it was faulted zone and it freed up and, you know, we were clearing out all the garbage that's created from like 30 million years of faulting, uh, fault slip. And with that came swelling clays that essentially destroyed the mud that we were using, which is water-based and not oil-based. So okay. the water-based mud allowed for, you know, these swelling clays to well, hydrate, so hydrating clays, which is an issue in Texas. Um, you switch over to oil base, so everything should be fine, and I'll hammer through the next 3,000 feet in two days, and I'll be running up and down and around the drilling rig. That's what you guys just ran into, and you just switched to an oil-based mud? Yeah. Gotcha. Is that pretty common down there? Uh, the mud engineer that I was talking to... Um, so he'd never had this occur before, as bad as it was. Um, you know, they're not blaming anyone for what they call slamming or, you know, at the, if they're supposed to be mixing the chemicals, uh, throughout their ship, but, you know, they're lazy and they just don't do it. And then when the end of the ship comes, they just throw everything in. So they call it slamming. Um, mm -hmm you know, throwing in all the, the mud additives at once can destroy, um, you know, the mud six, probably, what if it's 6,000, 1,600 barrels is about what they flow through. So 60,000-ish 60, gallons. So, you know, destroy that much fluid, um, it can happen, but, you know, they said that didn't happen. So it wasn't lazy drillers just slamming in all the mud additives. Um, they know that for sure. Uh, and they don't think it was petroleum coming in from the formation. Um, I mean, A, everyone would have smelled it. It would have stank up by the shaker tables. You'd smell the oil. And the gas was really low. And, uh, yeah. So pretty uncommon to have all of your mud turn into peanut butter and stop <laughs> drilling for three days. Yeah. And they had to circulate through for, it was like 36 hours to get everything out and Jeez. replace the rest of it, having it all trucked in and then trucked out. You got to take the, the garbage mud out. That's an unexpected expense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the company man was like super pissed off last two days That's in the safety the meetings. Guy. Yeah, you do not want to uh, have a happy-go-lucky conversation with the company, man, when something like that unexpected happens. No, no, I, I kept my head down. Yeah. <laughs> Went to the uh, logging trailer, hung out, took the gas, red third-party gas, uh, made the logs pretty, had a lot of time to check email. So, so if, if I was, let's just say like, for example, you know, a little fun hypothetical situation. If I was a mineral owner in a particular section in Texas, Oklahoma, wherever, uh, 
and I asked you, someone in the industry, in the upstream sector, I heard there was a fault in my section. A land man told me there was a fault in my section. Am I ever going to get drilled on? Is someone ever going to drill a horizontal well in my section? They're drilling them all around me. Why not in my section yet? Is it because of the fault? You know, what would, what would you tell them about the fault to kind of put them at ease or 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 educate them? Um, if it's large enough and it's going to create enough problems, you know, uh, yeah, not not drill there. But given <laughs> that it's it's uh, scoop stack in Oklahoma, everything is so there. There is so much data that you know a, a, a good operating company with good science behind it is going to be able to figure out how to how to have the proper well plan uh, in place to deal with faulting. That's why geologists exist. That's why geophysicists exist. And working with the drilling engineers and the geosteers and the directional drillers, um, you know, there was a plan in place for this well and the faults that we were going to get across. Um, and for the, you know, the unconventional reservoir, the vertical movement, so the up and down movement, when you're moving horizontally, you know, left and right versus up and down, uh, can be taken into account. You can account for that, and you'll know when you come across this area that maybe you're going to not be in the pay zone which you want to be exactly, but you'll come back into it again later. And, you know, if it's a gigantic fault and you're not going to hit the pay zone again, you know, it's either you're going to dive down to get back to it or get dive up on which direction it's faulted, reverse or normal, uh, or there's strike slip too, but you know most of the faults in that area that you're going to be dealing with are going to be either normal faulted or reverse faulted. So either you know you're going to have to steer up or steer down, right? Based upon um, uh, the faulting that's occurred. So you know it's probably not a big deal. You know if someone comes across, you know the landman or the, the person who owns the minerals says you've know, got a big fault here. And, you know, the, the operating company is going to come in and uh, buy the lease, activate the mineral rights, and, and start drilling. Um, should have the personnel and should have the know-how to be able to deal with, um, you know, a few hundred feet of, of faulting within their pay zone. So is that average, would you say, a few hundred feet? Yeah, tops. For most normal faults in the subsurface between, you know, Wolf Camp, Scoop Stack, a few hundred feet is going to be the biggest. Which is, I mean, peanuts compared to a 20,000 TD, you would think. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, your, your, your horizontals are, you know, we've got a, a, a vertical depth here ranging in the 8,800s or so. So they drilled. 8,800 feet down, and our our TD is uh, over just under 20,000. So you know it's like 11,000 feet that they're going to drill two miles. So you know in a, in a two mile horizontal well, um, you're going to have several hundred feet, occasionally maybe a thousand feet of um, not the exact pay that you want. Cost to do in business, right? Cost to be you for having that section, uh, but you're still going to have, you know, if you do good geology, you do, do good engineering and good science, you're going to have 10,000 feet of pay that you want. So, some, so next time someone says, there's a fault in that section, show me the data. Yeah, yeah. That should always be the uh, the next question, the next statement. Show me the data. Yeah. Let's see it. Well, cool. Um, that answers my questions. Anything else you wanted to say before we wrap up? Uh, no. It's good. Um, you want to throw out your uh, 
the company name and you know talk about uh, who you work for, what you do exactly. Yeah, so um, I'm with a company called Shellcase Energy out of Oklahoma City. Uh, like I said, we buy minerals and royalties, um, and mostly the scoop, stack, merge plays of Oklahoma. It's kind of our bread and butter, being that we're headquartered here. Um, but we can evaluate uh, and model pricing for acreage anywhere in the U.S., um, any basin. Um, and I'm the acquisitions manager at Shellcase, so I basically, to put it blunt, um, I'm a line of defense before uh, the um, final uh, call on any one deal, which would be um, actually my cousin, Miles Casey, who uh, who owns the company. So it's uh, family-owned, family-operated, and uh, yeah. Um, Basically, just as simple as that, we buy minerals and royalties, um, like to stay under, obviously, the heavy hitters, continentals of the world, um, just because they know what they're doing. And uh, that's pretty much that's pretty much the gist of what we do. Um, just like a mineral owner would um, get paid on their minerals through royalties, uh, we do the same thing. So cash is king, cash flow is king, which I think should be the... Uh, you know, shout out DRW, David Ramsden Wood. I think that should be the uh, the uh, the huge um, phrase in the industry right now. Cash flow is king, and cash, cash is flow king. is king, definitely. <laughs> but yeah, <clears throat> but yeah, I appreciate your time, man. Um, taking the time to kind of discuss faulting. Uh, it's always nice. Try to learn something every day. Obviously, you know, it's good to stay humble. Try to learn and get caught up in the daily grind and just think you know everything, but definitely uh, appreciate your time and, you know, uh, look forward to chatting with you more. Yeah. Hey, go Thunder. Yes, sir. We, <laughs> lost, uh, we lost Westbrook, but we're still going. Yeah, that's all right. Pretty yeah. solid otherwise. Yeah, for sure. But. Well, all right. Doran Malden, second acquisition manager, Showcase Energy. Thanks for the chat. And, uh, you know, drill, baby, drill. Cash yes, is king. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, enjoy it out there, man. Hope you guys uh, keep moving with that new oil-based mud. Yeah, hey, one foot at a time, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, take care. All right, I see you now.